Welcome to My View from the Piano Bench. We do this Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. here in my Joe Holtz Notes YouTube channel in addition to Piano for My Friends on Thursdays. Thank you for those of you who support and encourage me via or through the links you'll find on the support page of my website. You'll see a link to that page in the video description. Appreciate that and regular ongoing support such as Patreon, will elicit from me a thank you email each month with exclusive audio or video content, often behind the scenes or inside the process. So on Wednesdays, I move the phone camera closer and I take away some of the view of the piano, but it's less about the playing and for better or worse, and it could go either way, more about what I'm going to attempt to have to say. And this way I can speak without shouting across the room since at this point I still don't have the fancy audio equipment. I'm just using my phone and thank you all for accepting that. So lately with topics, uh, I've gone to subject matter, in particular tunes, particular tunes that elicit from me uh, a variety of avenues that I can travel. I don't just talk about the tune, I just let it take me where it does. And I found that or this to work out better than trying to write a script and play more and all of that. So I just let it go. And this one, I'm really not sure <laughs> where it's going to wind up, although I have an idea and I'm going to do my best. And this topic is not exactly what it looks like. It looks like I set up a boxing match, right? Fats Waller versus Blossom Deary. But I'm looking at it more like when you uh, Google search something and you want to see a comparison between them, you want to see the differences, then you put this versus that. And that's what I'm talking about. But in addition to differences and what prompted me to do this, there is a striking similarity. And these two pianists are references on my own musical journey. Fats Waller in the very beginning of discovering jazz as a teenager and Blossom Deary very recently challenging me uh, in a particular project and, you know, poking something in me that is it has been poked often, which is the, you know, desire to get myself around something that I don't really have myself around. And it's a combination of working to get there and realizing that it's not in my center of gravity mode of expression to completely get there because in the end I am my own thing we all are our own things or as I'll say sometimes I am my own normal we are all our own normal and we need to find that and center in it but you have two pianists one much more well known than the other in the general jazz community or just the general public there was actually a Broadway musical on Fats Waller. So most people know of Fats Waller. But you've got two people who are absolutely their own normal and their own thing. And those two people have been really influential in shaping most everybody who came after them to some degree in some way. And there are different ways that that has happened. Uh, so let's do the little overview of what I mean, and then I'll go back in. And I'm doing this just off the cuff because I think it's going to be better for me to just float around. And I know some people tell me, Joe, you can be hard to follow. So I'm going to do my best. Uh, so the first two pianists in the jazz realm that I was exposed to as a teenager uh, and I really paid attention to were Teddy Wilson and soon after that Fats Waller. And the Fats Waller left hand 
is really what captivated me. It was the Teddy Wilson right hand and the Fats Waller left hand. And the Fats Waller left hand, because I was already playing, you know, ragtime music in my piano lessons by then. <laughs> That was meant to replicate Fats Waller, and it was, I mean, not Fats Waller, <laughs> Scott Joplin. That wasn't exactly true, but it was close. It, it was true to the idea of, of ragtime. And I'll try not to dwell here too long, as I've talked about this before, and this is just the nature of stride piano. Uh, coming out of ragtime, and ragtime... <laughs> playing it a little rhythmically incorrect, uh, I'm trying to represent a march with a tuba. Of course, uh, Ragtime and Scott Joplin does not feel like a Sousa march, but underneath of it, it's the same thing. Like a tuba in the horns, but orchestrated to the piano. The thing that makes Scott Joplin and Fats Waller sound radically different is the sense of swing. Uh, and ragtime is, you don't call it jazz for a number of reasons, but primarily because it's not improvised. It's written note for note to be played note for note. And it's a march, but it's all syncopated up. You know. But then when you get to uh, Fats Wilder, if he played it, it would have a more swinging feel, and that's a uh, subtle but substantial uh, difference in how the beat is divided. And that swing feel, of course, is foundational in jazz and a very unique feel. Uh, so you have this tuba thing becoming... This kind of blueprint for an umpa feel. Fats Waller disciple, particularly in the right hand, and stride piano up until at that point was very uh, kind of quarter in the right hand. A lot of thirds and stuff, and I tend to be linear lyrical. You know, uh, so. And again, that's more like the Teddy Wilson right hand than the Fat Swaller left hand. But that rhythmic feel right? that sets stride piano in part, apart from ragtime, which is straight up and down. So when you play ragtime music, you could take a marching band and do it, right? Just straight up and down. Left, left, let me say. Left, right, left, right, march. Try to get them to march. They want to 
to step on two and four instead of one and three, or they want to sway around and not march in a straight line. <laughs> and so uh, ragtime and stride piano are way different things. There's one musician slash reviewer uh, that calls uh, stride piano industrial strength ragtime. You know, I I would I understand why he says that I would differ uh, from that, but anyway, uh, Fats Waller defined stride piano for everybody who came after. Now, of course, stride piano was a thing. He came at the end of that thing, and he just codified everything. And it's, you've heard me say this before, if you watch me, he, to me, much like uh, J.S. Bach, who uh, just perfected all of that polyphonic writing, all of that Baroque era. And after him, there was nowhere else to go, and it went a different way. And in the classical uh, timeline of style periods, the Baroque period ends when Bach died. Done. 1750. Bang. And then you have Mozart and Haydn, and it's a whole different bang. Right. So, there's that. That's a thing. Now, well, let me, let me stay here for a second. That thing is foundational to me. Uh, I spent a lot of time listening to Fats Waller, and particular in the left hand and realizing he's not, he's not playing octaves like Scott Joplin did. I started with single notes, because that's one way to play stride. Then I realized he was playing these open tents, and then he was putting notes in between. And my hand, as you can see my hand, I mean, when, I say I barely reach it. My little finger is only on just the very corner of that. I can't cover that E flat. If I try to cover the E flat with my little finger, I hit two notes with my thumb. So, you know, when you look at me and say, oh, you have a big hand, you can do stride easily. No. I have a just, just, just a big enough hand that when I sat in high school for hours and hours and hours at my desk doing stretches like this, which is more than I can do with my right hand, because with my right hand I cut my uh, wrist when I do it, because I knew I needed to get there. So I was listening to Fats Wilder, it's like, I want to play this style, I gotta get there. So this is more force of will, <laughs> you know, than, than a physical endowment, right? But I just make it, and I know there are players, a minority of players, because I have relatively small hands for the guy pianist, but there are guys who have smaller hands than I do and can't reach it. So I am you know, grateful that I can get there, even if it's by the skin of uh, my, you know, fingernail or something. And I don't consider myself a full-on stride pianist, in large part because I started listening to Fats Waller and I never really did you know, the foundational work with James P. and Willie Lyon and Donald Lambert and those guys. Of, of Fats Waller, but uh, you know that was what I kind of built this building of my own playing on. That's the foundation uh, underneath of it. So that's a thing. It's a it's it's the definitive thing. It's a defining thing. Uh, it's you know Fats Waller, Fats Waller, Stride, that. So. Blossom Deary, that's going to be a little harder to talk about because uh, Blossom Deary represents, and this is come, something I've only come to learn in recent few years, uh, represents the move in the harmonic foundations of jazz music 
away from the traditional approaches to harmony. Uh, now, that's a complicated statement, not entirely true, because before Blossom Deary, the whole bebop revolution happened. Uh, but what the bebop revolution was kind of doing was restructuring how the existing harmonic vocabulary was approached. It really didn't change the vocabulary. It kind of reorganized it so, somewhat. Uh, in particular, to allow a lot more virtuosity in playing, to allow uh, musicians to practice toward that virtuosity in a way that wasn't a straight line, clean cut kind of thing before, right? Uh, give me just one second, I just got to check one thing. Excuse me for getting distracted. It happens often in my head. Uh, uh, but as a pianist, what Blossom Deary did was put out there, and one of the very first to do it, the harmonic reorganization in terms of how chords are voiced or how the notes are arranged or stacked on each other, right? And in particular, harmony in fourths, as opposed to thirds, quarto harmony. Now this is gonna be a little uh, too much in the theory woods, and really even f for me. Uh, uh, I mean, not in terms of understanding what this is, but in terms of my own thought process. But you hear this nice little chord, different nature than this chord. So this would be tertiary, I think, is the pronunciation. Harmony, harmony in thirds. And then harmony in fourths. And so it's reorganizing the notes. And then, and that's the beginning of that real modern jazz sound. Uh, and apparently, uh, from what I'm reading and how I interpret what Bill Evans said about hearing Blossom Deary, it really strikes me that Blossom Deary was very influential in Bill Evans' own approach to that kind of harmony. And to any extent that that is true, and I don't think you can deny that to some extent it is true, when you read, I think Bill Levin said, yeah, when I heard Blossom Deary playing, you know, with, with fourth, it really knocked me out. That I can quote. It, it, it really knocked me out, right? So, and, and Blossom Deary was doing that before Bill Evans was recording. I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive. Uh, I should have checked my history, but this is really not a history course here. This is just me trying to explain some conceptual things and setting this up as best I can with my limited knowledge of some things. So we're gonna accept my premise and you are welcome to do a little digging and see if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. That that Blossom Deary is a maybe not the but a forerunner of that contemporary jazz harmony. And once it influences Bill Evans, Bill Ev Evans influenced everybody who came after him. Uh, you, you you could say that Bill Evans just took jazz, particularly jazz piano, and just put it in a whole nother place. You know, th th there are these just you know, touch points along the way, kind of in a way, like I said, with with uh, Bach and Fats Waller, you know. Uh, but instead of them finishing something, in a sense, 
so that people who came after had to start had to start something new. Bill Evans would represent the start of something, just like Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and the Bebop pioneers before that represented the start of something, and, and, and Miles Davis. And there's a connection between Miles Davis and Bill Evans, which is, which is interesting. Uh, and that little intersection of Miles Davis and, and, and Bill Evans is a really kind of kind of sweet spot in, in, in jazz. And it's one of those things where diverse things come together. And I've had this in, in, in my life. I can think of one thing in particular. You come at it like this, and then you have this weaving for a time, and both people are changed as a result of it, and then it goes on. So, anyway, uh, so so really, the real influential person was Bill Evans, but underneath of that was Blossom Deary, and I'm not prepared to say without Blossom Deary there wouldn't be Bill Evans, but to the extent. The Blossom Deary influence Bill Evans. I'm going to liken her to Fats Waller, a thing. Fats Waller was a thing, and an influential thing. Same with Blossom Deary. Uh, now, I am less equipped to demonstrate uh, that because that's not the way I play, which was a real challenge when I realized that after agreeing to do the Blossom Deary uh, tribute project path with Sharon Sable. Uh, and should I be embarrassed when I say that? Because when Sharon approached me about doing that, I was aware of Blossom Deary the singer more than Blossom Deary the pianist. And I knew that as a vocalist, that was perfect for Sharon. And Sharon could do that in her own voice. It wouldn't be, you know, just an imitation by, by, by any stretch, but it would be in that same spirit. And it would, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful tribute, what, what she does. As one reviewer has said, uh, Sharon uh, adds to Blossom's legacy without recreating her voice or so, so, something like that, which was, which was perfect. Uh, but as I started listening, I'm realizing, oh my goodness, I hear what she's doing. And I have to represent that in some way because uh, I just didn't know how quite the nature of the pianist and how influential ultimately she was. And it's kind of ironic because I look at the general public who still like to hear Nat King Cole sing forever. And then they realize if they even find out what he was a piano player, he plays piano too. Actually, he was a pianist first. <laughs> yeah. And an influential pianist. You know, Nat King Cole was a very influential pianist to me, right? And to a lot of people who came after it, uh, Oscar Peterson and, and, and such. And in this sort of age of singers being prominent, when somebody becomes a singer, you don't even think about what, what else they do. So that Nat King Cole syndrome that I talk about with other people comes back to bite me with Blossom Deary, right? And so I'm realizing, now not that I don't use some of this harmony, but I don't have a, a construction system to make that a super integral part of my playing uh, in the center of gravity space. And not that I haven't tried, especially early on, especially in my 20s, uh, when... I was well aware of my shortcomings and took lessons from a, a prominent jazz pianist uh, for, for a good long time and learned about the concepts and, and such, but also learned that I couldn't go back and reorganize my own internal structure that was put together by my intuition all along the way. You know, because I'm much more of an intuitive learner than a, a, a knowledge-based learner or, a, you know, book learner. Right? And I'll figure something out in the essence of the thing, and then I can flesh out the details, as opposed to somebody who, like, has to learn all the details, and then he gets the bigger picture. You know, that's just two different, two different approaches. So I already had an approach to playing, and I, you know, it's way, way too much thought, 
way, way too much, you know, math uh, for me to be in the moment with. Uh, but I have sit, sat, sat sitting. Uh, I have in the past sat down and worked out some things, and some things seep into the playing. And the point of this is, if I'm going to represent Blossom Deary, there has to be some of that in my playing. Uh, now, interesting, in the, in the reviews that have started to come in for the Blossom Deary CD, <laughs> I had to, you know, smile at one of them who calls me a full-on stride pianist. He can say that. I would disagree. Right? Uh, but people call Dave McKenna a stride pianist, and he would disagree, and he's not. And I'm much more like him. I don't have the full bag, but I definitely, you know, can do it and, and such. But anyway, I get why he said that. And, uh, and I can do it. I'm not dissing myself, but there's just some aspects of it. I'm not completely well-rounded, right? But uh, I'm a full-on stride pianist, and he puts that in the, in the review for Blossom Deary, and it's like, well, that's interesting, you know. Uh, now, when Scott Yano did that, he said, due to his background in, in stride piano, he's able to function as a one-person rhythm section behind Sharon. That was, a, that was a really great observation. And that's how I look at it, you know. And steeped in that stride era means I'm self-accompanying and... If I'm not playing a stride feel, maybe I'm walking. Which is still filling up all the space. Or maybe I'm playing a... A bossa nova feel. Or I'm doing something else. And, you know, starting out with stride gave me the perspective to be able to actually to need to not be able to need to fill up all the space and feel everything there is to feel w w within that so that kind of sets me up if i can and i have translate that to other styles right to be an effective solo piano accompanist right uh this up uh, this reviewer i mentioned first though didn't create that context and so that review, uh, if it's ever used for anything, and I don't intend to use that particular review, I don't think, but if it were, it would it would be intriguing because it's like, well, what's Fats Waller doing playing Blossom Deary? That wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, but I think you get my point that you know Fats Waller is a thing to be represented, and I can't replicate it, but I can represent it. Uh, Blossom Deary is a thing... And I can't replicate it, nor should I. But to some extent, I need to represent it. That's my point. And, you know, and there are passages and there are things that I, I've played with, and I can kind of demonstrate it here. Let me see. Getting this up in the space. some flaws there but uh you know i can play around there and so what i've had to do uh for the recording in particular and you know i'm admitting this and i probably shouldn't but i don't know it is what it is uh a few of the things i have worked out and written out ahead of time uh in order to be able to represent that aspect of Blossom. And then other, other tunes in that uh, uh, recording, I just let myself go and, and be the person I am. And in the uh, 
solo feature of the recording, sorry, with the fringe on top, I'm just my own ridiculous self. And that's where the guy got full on stride pianist. Although uh, I kind of um, am in the Dave McKenna bag for uh, one of them that we do solo. <laughs> Fascinate me so. Uh, so there that is. Um, so both of those players represent a an important historical building block of jazz. I'm more connected to the first one than the second. Uh, most every modern pianist is more connected to the second one than the first. And very few modern pianists play stride. And are more influenced by the harmony of Blossom Deary. And ironically, Blossom Deary, at least as she would say, didn't improvise. She worked out everything in advance. Now that's interesting. And that is not... A modern approach so much is as if man I can't talk that's more of a traditional approach than a modern approach and back in the uh, the big band era it was not uncommon nor necessarily frowned upon for musicians to work out their solos ahead of time and then play the same solo night after night uh, and to some extent, that happens in contemporary jazz, too, but it happened even more then. And improvisation, of course, is considered central to jazz, but the definition of jazz ultimately is complicated and also has to do with the rhythmic component and all of that. <laughs> direction I'm feeling right now.
putting on there? Uh, I started playing I Can't Give You Anything But Love and started playing it without any agenda. It was just like, okay, I need to see where this is going to take me. I'm going to play a little bit and it's going to show me. And actually, that's a whole other subject. The music, the piano, shows me where to go. I don't tell it where to go if I really want it to go. And let's take a detour here. And hopefully I remember what I was going to, going to talk about. I'm forgetting already, but let me just do this. Uh, that is the big life lesson for me at the piano. You've heard me talk about the book I'll Never Write, but I think about everything I ever needed to know in life I learned at the piano. The music takes you there. Right? The surrendering to being led, to following, to having it come through you, right? takes you to places that you would not think of because you're kind of trapped in your own little, little place. So, uh, since I've changed the direction or the focus or the approach to these videos in, in the last few months to not scripting anything and having a, a, a general topic, I've allowed myself to do that. And I think the universal consensus is these videos have gotten better because I'm in a much better place uh, when I'm able to allow flow. And what jazz musician has said it, uh, I can't remember now, but thought is the enemy of flow. And it really is. And so when you get in your flow state, and for me, because you know, this is the thing for me, this is where I live, you know, I express myself with the piano. I've done it since I was a child, right? Uh, this is where I can leave my thoughts behind. And everybody has some place or experience where that can happen, where they get into some zone, you know, so, so, some activity. And for me, it's here. And when I practice in the morning, the first thing I practice to is opening that portal up because if I ever need to get deep in anything or approach something profound or I need something important that I need to respond to or whatever I need to do it from that space and the piano gives me access to that What that has meant in the last two minutes is I had to allow myself to let go of what, what I thought about to say because I just kind of decided at that moment that making that observation is more important. So this is actually good. It'll give me a chance to illustrate something. <laughs> when I need to find, when I need to play something kind of the same way twice, which I can't do exactly, but like when you're accompanying somebody, you need to get in that same zone. I actually need to find it again. I need to go back into that moment and, 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 and set up, you know. And once the moment opens up, the portal opens up, uh, if it's like a foundational feel or something, if it's something that's been, you know, rehearsed and it's a thing, I'll find it again. If it's an idea, like if I do it now to find it again, I might not find the same thing, or I might. So this is like an actual semi-real-time uh, demonstration of something, which could make me nervous, but if I'm nervous about it, I'm thinking about it, and I just have to detach myself from that, you know, and... You know, not, not still my mind. I can't. Just step away from it and look at it. Smile at it, wave to it perhaps, but don't engage it. And then we'll just play again. Let me just see what it was I was going to talk about. Who knows? Of it anyway. Uh, 
So these two pianists, Fats Waller and Blossom Deary, had d very definable sounds and approaches. Uh, and not that they weren't flexible, but flexible within a small box. And you could argue that Blossom Deary's box may have been smaller than, than, than Fats Waller's. But Fats Waller never not sounded like Fats Waller, you know, in terms of the, the style he played uh, and, and rhythmically. Uh, and Fats Waller didn't live long enough to record with uh, Charlie Parker or Dizzy Gillespie. And uh, if he did, it would have been like a novelty recording, probably. You know, because that's, he was just, that was his thing. Now, Blossom Deary was a jazz trio or combo pianist. And those voicings that you learn, this is part of the reason that I don't live there with them, because I primarily play solo. In fact, I should have looked up ahead of time. I've got some, some books here, and I, I, I look through them. There, there's one particular book <laughs> that the, the author is just deciding that harmony bass in thirds has got to go, and you have to reconstruct everything in fourths, right? And... You know, it's all this schematic diagram math about remembering this and this and this, but all the chords are for chordal based chords. But then when you're doing that, you have to have a bass player. You 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 have to have a bass player because you're not playing the bass lines. You're not being Dave McKenna. You can't do that. Your whole thing is devoted to that to that voicing. It's it's a combo based approach. And when Blossom and for me if I'm playing solo, I can't pretend there's no bass player. In fact, when I am with a bass player, uh, I don't play the typical left-hand chords. I kind of play off the bass player and play like cello lines to the bass player's bass lines, and I stay out of the way, and I, I do it, but it's my own sort of thing. I respond to that, right? Uh, but when there's no bass player there, I fill up that space. But... When Balsam Deary plays solo, it's the exact, exact same thing that she plays when uh, she's playing in a combo. And it's not just her. It's a lot of solo pianists. And uh, what they'll do uh, sometimes is revoice some things and reach down and play a bass note occasionally and then such. But they're not filling up the space like they're playing the bass lines and such. So I'll probably forget because I forget everything once I do it, as I've just demonstrated. Uh, but if I remember, I'll put a link in the description to a particular video. You can easily search for it, though. Uh, uh, Billy Taylor interviewing Blossom Deary. Back when Billy Taylor was doing, I think, the CBS Sunday morning thing, uh, back in, I guess, the 90s, maybe. Uh, and uh, Blossom Deary played I'm Hip and sang it. And, or you can watch any other solo recording of Blossom Deary without a band. Uh, there's another of her doing I'm Hip from the uh, Nice Jazz Festival in Nice, Nice, N-I-C-E, in uh, 1986. The, <laughs> the one where the first thing she does is chastise somebody in the audience for taking a picture. Something, by the way, that Sharon loves. <laughs> so she likes to point that out. Blossom's a badass, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, but when she plays I'm hip, it's the same voicings. It's just no, nothing down here. The same chords, the same thing. And that, that is an authenticity uh, right there. It's like, I am this. I am always this. Now, let me take this topic now, because there is something I'm just going to try to do, and this will give me the, the chance to try to do it, and pull it into my own expression. Because I don't have that kind of authenticity, where it's like, this is what I do, and 
this is what I'm going to do because this is who I am. Because whenever I play, and I've kind of talked about that, I play different every time, depending on my environment, right? Depending if I'm playing solo or if I'm playing with somebody. Now, in a, in a different way, but not dissimilar, Fats Waller, when he was with the rhythm section or he was by himself, would play pretty much the same way. And, a, you know, very heavy-handed stride player. And so if there was going to be no just, you know, groovy walking, you know, four-beat bass thing, it's going to sound like the Count Basie band with Freddie Green playing when Fats Waller was chunking back and forth. And he would play with the rhythm section, and the bass player had to deal with that. And I don't know that Fats Waller, if he, if he ever got out of the way, it wasn't much, right? Oh. But that's funny I said Count Basie, because you can see Count Basie sort of striding in his uh, big band, but he, when, when the band is going, he's not getting in the way of it, and he understands what's going on uh, rhythmically. So you have the authenticity of Fats Waller, you have the authenticity of Blossom Deary, or you know, any other great player, and I don't have that kind of authenticity. I have been told, and I get this, that you can recognize as me, you know, by, by, by things I do, you know, but it's not because I'm doing the same structural thing every time. And that's really my point. So that led me to ask myself the question, what is my authenticity? And that putting this subject together, which was a result of uh, a suggestion actually to build one of these videos around the exploration of uh, Blossom Deary's approach to playing. And I didn't feel totally equipped to do that, but as I pondered it, it led me to this greater thing here, which it's kind of where I go. I go to the big picture and because there's always a big picture. And the more the more you have the big picture in view, the more context you have to understand anything within that picture. And so that's kind of how I approach it. And if I'm talking about my authenticity, that's really it, right? But then how does that translate to playing? Because, you know, I might semi-sound like Fats Waller sometimes. I may semi-sound like Blossom Deary sometimes. I may sound like Earl Garner sometimes. I may sound a lot like Dave McKenna sometimes, as we know. Yeah, that was terrible. But you, you know what I mean. And I can never say I sound like Oscar Peterson sometimes because I don't have any of the chops. But I emulate... You know, his beautiful sense of feel and, and soul. For the, to me, the authenticity of Oscar Peterson, okay, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Whew. Oh, look at the view. Uh, the, authentic, the, the, the authenticity of Oscar Peterson is the extent to which, more than anyone else, he takes that ridiculous technique of his, which is not the only one who has it, uh, but he breathes all of that soul into every single note of it. Totally in control of the expression that he gives every note at that level of technique. Whew! Man, and it knocks you out. I heard him live once. Oh my goodness. It changed my life. Uh, so this one little lick... Is, is something that I practice slow, which 
which is the first little break in the CJ and Blues recording from the Night Train album. See, and now, see, when you practice something, you think about the fingering, which you don't do when you're improvising. And when I think about the fingering, I stick my thumb on this G. But I gotta remember. I get. I do that. But then when I don't remember, I forget to do it, then I watch myself finger it some other way, then that gets my mind turned around. Because that's kind of what I'm talking about. I gotta go straight intuition. Ah, it was terrible. What I want to do is just grow and grow and grow and grow, and I'm not demonstrating it very well right now, in at slower tempos than Oscar, feeling what he feels and being able to express through the notes what I'm feeling. And this is going to lead me to finally defining what my authenticity is, if I can, because, you know, I'm inside of it. What do I know? But in contemplating it, I think my authenticity is simply being in the moment. stop because I I was I think in there for the first part of that and then I started thinking about stuff and I and and, and, and I fell out uh, and this is why I love accompanying so much because you have somebody to connect with and you share this moment and you release to it and I call it holding hands in the middle, right? Uh, but I also love playing solo. And I finally reconciled that a couple of years ago. That the, the things I do as a soloist are really the same things I do as an accompanist. And that led me to describe my solo playing is also accompanying, but what am I accompanying? I'm accompanying the experience of the audience. And one of the things that, you know, to the extent I'm known, you know, which is not great, but, you know, to, to the extent to which I'm known and what, what, what am I known for? I think it's connecting with, with an audience, or as I like to say, taking a lasso and throwing it around the room and putting everybody in the same space. And the, the great performers can, can, can do that. They can draw you into that space with them. And, you know, I don't do it through a particular prowess, uh, like Blossom Deary's, you know, beautiful harmonies that she worked out uh, on the piano. Uh, I don't do it through a particular skill set that's repeatable of uh, having a like an arrangement of a handful of keys that Fats Waller can play and play pretty much the same way every time and, and nail it with virtuosity. Uh, I don't I don't have that. But I have or I aspire to an open heart at all times. Which is impossible. And now we can go down a theological road, uh, uh, which I won't do, and that's, of course, a minefield right there. But j j just to say, if you talk about the Christian doctrine of the sinful nature of humanity, 
And I had a professor in college who was a, 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 a it's a Buddhist, and a devout hater of all Western concepts, right? But he had to say, as much as I hate to go here because to do this, it references the idea of the Western God. There's no better explanation for the state of affairs in history of humanity than the fact of, than the idea of the sinful nature of man or humanity. Right? Uh, and you know, if we could separate that from things that would make, make, make people object to that and, and, and just talk about, you know, getting off the mark, that's up here. So if I have an open heart, I can trust where I'm led, right? And then if I decide to be fearful or concerned or agenda-driven, all things that move away from an open heart, right? Uh, that's my mind getting in the way. And, and this is what I would call the sinful nature. This is where it comes from. Right? Uh, now, it gets all complicated because <laughs> I said open heart as opposed to closed or hard or dark. Or as I like to say, keep the light on in here. Right? So... You, you, you're going to go down this real long theological road about, about, about what that means. And that's not my point. Uh, and neither is, is it my point to obsess over the details of that, like many do, with the, like the analysis of a lawyer or an accountant uh, of, of, of detail. Just like I can't get my playing to a level by thinking it through and constructing it like these other great people did. But do I have a contribution? Yes, because I'm approaching it from here. Right? And in my Piano for My Friends videos, that's why in the last, especially year or so, I've purposed, really, or at least allowed myself, to go full out on the transitions from tune to tune, to just be ridiculous inside of tunes and just be totally open because I think that's my authenticity. My authenticity is just like, what just happened? <laughs> Where'd that come from? Oh, good grief. <laughs> right? and, and, and so when I look at Fats Waller, when I look at Blossom Deary and I admire that out the wazoo, then I said, okay, what's, what's, what am I doing? And I think I just described it as best I can. And if you bring something to the table of substance or value or meaning, yeah, then there's going to be a place for you to sit. And I've always, that's been why, why I've been able to stay in music, even though I've had so many uh, episodes, so many of like, I need not do this. Okay, I'm uh, or I'm sick of this, or this doesn't work. And here I go again, and I always come back to, no, this is who I am. And I've always believed, not that I'm a great player, but that's a conclusion. I don't want to draw a conclusion. But I believe that I have a contribution to make. If I, if I choose to submit to that path and succumb to that. And whatever that contribution is, whenever that is, whatever that is, is what I'll try to make. I could get caught up in, okay, well, I need to make this contribution. I need to do this. I need to do that. And then that's another struggle. It's like, be in the moment. Be, be your own puppy dog. You know? Just be in the moment. And chase that stick with all the gusto you got, right? <laughs> so... Okay, I think this worked. I started this believing that it could take me there if my mind was going to, you know, like 
fire enough if my you know cells are awake and when i started and i was having trouble putting sentences together i'm like this might not work but i think it did i, th I think it did uh, appreciate your feedback i appreciate your support and i hope to see you very soon stay in touch